So today we're talking about uh, mostly two issues of validity and reliability. And these are, uh, validity is the most important uh, fundamental issue in research design and uh, measurement. Uh, uh, reliability and validity are both relevant for the issue of measurement. And uh, as the, uh, towards the end, if we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll spend on presenting you, because uh, we've talked about research methods, uh, but, the, but there, there are broader issues about research, uh, quantitative research, empirical quantitative research in social science in general. Uh, that is the, uh, the, how do I, the, the replication crisis recently in, in social psychology and the, the changes in the field that's ongoing in the field. So yeah, without further ado, let's just go into the first topic, uh, research design. So we, we've already studied a lot about how to analyze the data and research design is really just about, uh, about given uh, how, to, how the data is collected in a way that can address our research questions. And we've, we've already, uh, well, the, the most important bit of research design is probably experimental design. And that is just my expertise on this as, uh, as well, because I'm not a, I'm not a uh, correlational design researcher. And there are lots of fancy correlational designs out there, but uh, we're not gonna deal, uh, uh, talk about that much today. Uh, but we've, uh, the, the, the idea of randomized experiments, uh, you prob it's, it's, it's quite straightforward. So you randomly assign participants into different groups. Usually these, some, uh, uh, some of the groups, groups are treatment groups, and they're usually one uh, or more groups that uh, serve as the baseline or control group. And then we draw conclusions because we, uh, and because we've, we have randomized in the sense that we have randomly assigned participants into different conditions, then we can draw uh, some kind of causal inferences. Yeah, inferences. That is inference about a uh, causal relationship that our manipulation actually caused some kind of changes in the outcomes. A little bit about, about that later, but uh, here's the uh, uh, Esther Dufflo. Uh, she is one of the Nobel Prize winner for, uh, of, uh, Nobel, uh, winners of uh, Nobel Prize for Economics in, I think, 2019. And in the field, uh, in economics, there's a lot of research being done using this randomized experiments. And here's her, uh, a video of her talking about re uh, her research. And that utilizes randomized experiments to solve some of the problems in uh, developing countries, especially. So take a look, then you see that how and you can see how uh, uh, randomized experiments has been used, utilized, not just in, because it's usually used in medical science to test drugs, and, but in this, in this case, it's been used in social science. So I think that's very interesting. Okay. So that's her TED talk. I can answer them. It's not the Middle Ages anymore, it's the 21st century. And in the 20th century, randomized controlled trials have revolutionized medicine by allowing us to distinguish between drugs that work and drugs that don't work. And you can do the same randomized controlled trial for social policy. You can pull social innovation to the same rigorous scientific test that we use for drugs. And in this way, you can take the guesswork out of policy making by knowing what works, what doesn't work, and why. And I'll give you some examples with those three questions. So I start with immunization. Here's Uday Pur district, Rajasthan. Beautiful. Well, when I started working there, about 1% of children were fully immunized. That's bad, but there are places like that. Now, it's not because the vaccines are not there. They are there and they are free. And it's not because parents do not care about their kids. The same child that is not immunized against measles, if they do get measles, parents will spend thousands of rupees to help them. So you get these empty village sub-centers and crowded hospitals. So what's the problem? 
Well, part of the problem surely is people do not fully understand. After all, in this country as well, all sorts of myths and misconceptions go around immunization. So if that's the case, that's difficult, because persuasion is really difficult. But maybe there is another problem as well. It's going from intention to action. Imagine you're a mother in Udaipur district, Rajasthan. You have to walk a few kilometers to get your kids immunized. And maybe when you get there, what you find is this, the sub-center is closed, so you have to come back. And you are so busy and you have so many other things to do, you will always tend to postpone and postpone, and eventually it gets too late. Well, if that's the problem, then that's much easier. Because A, we can make it easy, and B, we can maybe give people a reason to act today rather than wait till tomorrow. So these are simple ideas, but we didn't know, so let's try them. So what we did is we did a randomized control trial in 134 villages in Odeipo district. So in the blue dots are, are selected randomly, we made it easy. I'll tell you how in a moment. In the red dots, we made it easy and gave people a reason to act now. The white dots are our comparisons, nothing changed. So we make it easy by organizing this monthly camp where people can get their kids immunized. And then you make it easy and give a reason to act now by adding a kilo of lentil for each immunization. Now, a kilo of lentil is tiny. It's never going to convince anybody to do something that they don't want to do. On the other hand, if your problem is you tend to postpone, then it might give you a reason to act today rather than later. So what do we find? Well, beforehand, everything is the same. That's the beauty of randomization. Afterwards, the camp, just having the camp, increased immunization from 6% to 17%. That's full immunization. That's not bad. It's a good improvement. Add the lentils, and you reach to 38%. So here is you got your answer. Make it easy and give a kilo of lentils. You multiply immunization rate by 6. Now you might think, well, but it's not sustainable. We cannot keep giving lentils to people. Well, it turns out it's wrong economics, because it is cheaper to give lentils than not to give them. Since you have to pay for the nurse anyway, the cost per immunization ends up being cheaper if you give incentive than if you don't. How about bed nets? Should you give them for free, or should you ask people to pay for them? So the answer hinges on the answer to three simple questions. One is, if people must pay for bed net, are they going to purchase them? The second one is, if I give bed net for free, are people going to use them? And the third one is, do free bed nets discourage future purchase? That third one is important, because if we think people get used to handouts, it might destroy markets to distribute free bed nets. Now, this is a debate that has generated a lot of emotion and angry rhetorics. It's more ideological than practical, but it turns out these are easy questions. We can know the answer to this question. We can just run an experiment. And many experiments have been run, and they all have the same results, so I'm just going to talk to you about one. And this one that was in Kenya, they went around and distributed to people vouchers, discount vouchers, so people could, with their voucher could get the bed net in the local pharmacy. And some people get 100% discount, and some people get 20% discount, and some people get 50% discount, etc. And now we can see what happens. So how about the purchasing? Well, what you can see is that when people have to pay for the bed nets, the coverage rate really falls down a lot. So even with partial subsidy, $3 is still not the full cost of a bed net, and now you only have 20% of people with the bed nets. You lose the herd immunity, that's not great. Second thing is, how about the use? Well, the good news is, people, if they have the bed nets, will use the bed nets, regardless of how they got it. If they get it for free, they use it. If they have to pay for it, they use it. How about the long term? In the long term, people who got the free bed nets, one year later, were offered the option to purchase a bed net at $2. And people who got the free one are actually more likely to purchase the second one than people who didn't get a free one. So people do not get used to handouts, they get used to nets. Maybe we need to give them a little bit more credit. <laughs> so that's for bed nets. So you would think, well, that's great, you know how to immunize kids, you know how to give bed nets. But what politicians need is a range of options. They need to know, out of all the things I could do, what is the best way to achieve my goals. So suppose your goal is to get kids into school. There's so many things you could do. You could pay for a uniform, you could eliminate fees, you could build latrines, you could give girls sanitary pads, etc., etc. So what's the best? Well, at some level, we think all of these things should work. 
So is that sufficient? Like, if we think they should work intuitively, should we go for them? Well, in business, that's certainly not the way we would go about it. Consider, for example, transporting goods. Before the canals were invented, uh, in, in Britain, before the Industrial Revolution, goods used to go on horse carts. And then canals were built, and with the same horseman, the same horse, you could carry 10 times as much cargo. So should they have continued to carry the goods on the horse carts on the ground that they would eventually get there? Well, if that had been the case, there would have been no industrial revolution. So why shouldn't we do the same with social policy? In technology, we spend so much time experimenting, fine-tuning, getting the absolute cheapest way to do something. So why aren't we doing that with social policy? Well, with experiments, what you can do is answer a simple question. Suppose you have $100 to spend on various interventions. How many extra years of education do you get for your $100? Now I'm going to show you what we get with uh, various education interventions. So the first one are if you want the usual suspect. Higher teachers, school meals, school uniforms, scholarships. That's not bad. For your $100, you get between one and three extra years of education. Things that don't work so well is bribing parents, just because so many kids are already going to school that you end up spending a lot of money. And here are the more surprising results. Tell people the benefits of education. That's very cheap to do. So for every $100 you spend doing that, you get 40 extra years of education. And in places where there are worms, intestinal worms, cure the kids of their worms. And for every $100, you get almost 30 extra years of education. So these are not your intuition. This is not what people would have gone for. And yet, these are the programs that work. We so those are her Nobel Prize winning work in economics. And you can see that the methodology is, is relatively it's relatively simple in that uh, it's just randomized trials. But what's interesting is a few things, right? The first of all is finding what, uh, what interventions to test, right? And, and you can see that that's usually a quite creative process. Finding the right kind of intervention requires creative thinking, requires going over uh, previous literatures and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, although the idea of randomized trial seems to be quite easy, but finding the right kind of intervention, intervention that, to test is usually the difficult part. The second bit is uh, interesting point is that uh, the way that she, uh, in the third study where she showed the benefits of $100 spending on, on spend on different kind of a ways of uh, of uh, uh, encouraging, uh, promoting education, is that she uh, the way she quantifies the outputs, uh, the outcomes, uh, in terms of it's almost like an, an, an effect size, right? But quantified in a way that's easy for for people to comprehend. So, the, uh, so the idea of randomized trials is so simple, and and a lot of people have doubts about this method just because how simple it is. But it, it, is, it is the way, uh, the gold standard of, of research going forward. And part of the reason is that uh, the randomized trials and randomized experiments is the only way of establishing some kind of causal effects. So these are the conditions for, for establishing causal effects. Uh, the first is that the, the independent variable and dependent variable, they should co-vary, right? So that's fine, like if you, you, can, you can establish co-variation using statistical methods, as we have shown uh, in our last four or five uh, four, four, four lectures. But a second uh, condition is, uh, could be only met, uh, that is the independent variable should actually be preceded the, the dependent variable. And that's actually uh, the, the, the difficult part because the, uh, in, in the correlation study, if you measure things at the same time, uh, then your independent variable and dependent variable are, are measured at the same time. So it's only through uh, the randomized trials that uh, you can have a manipulation first and you observe the output, uh, the outcome of that, of that manipulation. 
So the third condition is that there should be uh, some kind of theoretically plausible explanation about how independent variable influences dependent variable. And that, that's, not, that's also not that difficult for all kinds of research. Uh, the, the, fourth fact, uh, the fourth condition is that the other factors must have been controlled for. Okay, but this is also extremely difficult to achieve in correlational designs without kind of a, a, any kind of a randomization, a random assignment of participants. Because any factors are just being measured, if, it, if other factors are just being measured at the same time, then it's not actually being actively controlled for. You can statistically control for other factors, but that's not actually uh, controlling for factors during the research design, right? And uh, randomization, uh, uh, research in economics and sociology, I think, uh, I think this is a sociology paper. Uh, well, it was published on, on, on the economic journal that I just read uh, a couple of days ago. So I saw this interesting to share with you guys. So what they did is uh, randomizing religion. Huh? So uh, uh, they look at the impact of different kind of uh, church-based programs on economic outcomes of extremely poor communities in the uh, in Philippines, I think that's where it is. So here's the uh, some some from the uh, from uh, the abstract, and you can see that uh, they claim they 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 through a randomized evaluation they were able to uh, establish causal impact of re religiosity, because they claim that uh, in, in our previous research. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to actually study the causal impact of, 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 relig of, of religiosity uh, through an experiment. So this is the paper that they claimed to have done that. And these, uh, they have, uh, they, I think they have 14 uh, different programs, I think. Uh, if you're interested, I can, uh, I will share the paper with you afterwards in the, in the, in the, in the folder. And they, they looked at uh, Protestant Christian values uh, and different kinds of the theology education programs de delivered to thousands of ultra poor Filipino households. Uh, what they found is that uh, six months after the program has ended, uh, those households who have received these these programs have higher higher religiosity, which is uh, expected, but they also have higher level of income. But at the same time, they also have lower perceived relative economic status. They perceive themselves as relatively lower in terms of economics. And uh, interestingly, they did also did some exploratory analysis suggesting that uh, the income effect may uh, operate through increasing grit. So the uh, grit is a, is a term that describes the, uh, the trait of resilience. You know, uh, those with high levels of grit are more likely to work hard through difficult times towards you know, overcome difficulties. And uh, interestingly, they also look at 30 months after the program, and they found that uh, the, the differences in the religiosity has disappeared, but uh, those in the treat that in terms of, of, of religiosity, those in the treatment group are less likely to be Catholic and more likely to be Protestant. Uh, and there's some mixed evidence uh, about the consumption and perceived relative economic status. Uh, but based on these uh, randomized treatment study, they, they said that they concluded that the church-based program might actually represent a method of helping poverty among those in developing countries. Again, uh, it is an, another very controversial study. Uh, despite the randomized uh, trial nature of the study, people still questions whether, questioned whether the uh, how do I say the the participants' uh, previous uh, prior experience with 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 with, with religion can actually be controlled for, but the idea of, of randomization is that if you if you just randomly assign participants, that then any differences between individual differences are are random, 
okay? So those with different uh, prior experience with religion should be randomly assigned into each treatment group and the control group. So in the long, uh, on average, they kind of cancel each out, cancel each other out uh, because they are random variants due to the randomization process. And uh, in terms of research design, uh, we've already heard, uh, learned about the between subject design and within subject, subject design. Uh, these are again, experimental designs. In the between subject design, you have random assignments of participants into different groups. And in within subject design, uh, the, uh, the participants will go through all conditions, or or treatment conditions. So the, the, the term making a plan was actually used in the, my example of a coronavirus study for, uh, for actually trying to uh, reduce people's stockpiling uh, urgency, urgent sense of urgency for, uh, for stockpiling. Uh, I would say that if you ask people to make some kind of a plan, they can regain sense of control, uh, then, then you can uh, reduce their urge to, to stockpile. But, uh, as we have illustrated before, using the power analysis, we can see that if we keep it between subjects, then your power is kind of limited because uh, you're, you're limiting your power with, with the same amount of participants. If you have 100 participants, each group only have 50 participants if you, do a, if you have two groups. But with a within subject design, because both conditions have uh, all the participants, then you have 100 participants per group per condition. So whenever you can, you try always try to utilize within subject design to maximize your, uh, your research power, your statistical power, and to reduce the cost of your, of your research. But there are some concerns about within subject design, which we will uh, we, we, we'll talk about later. There also sometimes you have mixed design. Uh, we uh, realized we didn't really talk about the, uh, how the data can be analyzed. Uh, but yeah, that you, if you're interested, you can find the, uh, the specific analysis that are tailored towards the uh, analysis of variance, tailored towards mixed design or repeated or uh, within subject designs. So one of the biggest concerns about within subject design is the order in which participants are exposed to each condition because uh, responses, behaviors, or treatment, uh, the treatment you received in the experimental condition can further carry it on to the next condition and influence the responses in the next condition. So if that's the case, you want, might want, want to uh, have a, uh, this uh, experiment, uh, making a plan as the within subject factor, but you uh, counterbalance what they call counterbalance the, the, the order between the two conditions. Uh, so for half of the participants, you have one, uh, one order, and for the other half, you have the other order. Th in this way, you still have 100, say you have 100 participants, you still have 100 participants per each, uh, each, exp uh, each condition, but then now you can, you can uh, integrate uh, another between subject factor that is ordered into the uh, analysis that you'll be running. So the more factors can you uh, integrate into the research design, that makes it possible to tease out the uh, their effect in terms of uh, the variance has been accounted for by these factors, right? Uh, and therefore uh, that will gives you uh, that will gives you, uh, how do I say, makes it easier to, makes it easier to, uh, to identify the factors that you're actually interested in. In this case, it's the uh, making a plan as an, uh, as an intervention. Okay, so, so this is related to the, to the, to the topic of research validity. Uh, we, we, we introduce these experimental designs, not only we want to do, uh, because we want to get significant results, but also 
we want to enhance the validity of our, our, of our research. So the, the topic of uh, internal validity, there, there are two types of research validity. One is internal, the other is external. Uh, internal uh, basically uh, means that how confident about the conclusions that you're drawing from the data. So how confident can we be if we draw conclusions from data obtained through, a, uh, through this particular research design? The critical issues is there, are there any plausible explanations other than the factors that you're interested in, right? So these plausible explanations, if we have, if we have failed to account for them and reviewers, for example, happen to find them in your research design, then they can, they can start to propose other plausible explanations to your research findings. So these, this is a question about confounds, right? And the goal of the design is trying to eliminate confounds or take confounds into consideration, right? Take these other factors into consideration. For example, in the previous example, if the order can be uh, a factor, then we have, to, we have to take order into consideration and integrate order into our research design. Then we can tease apart uh, the variance accounted for by order, just because we have the experimental design, we can tease that apart in our analysis. Uh, the, the issue of external validity in contrast is uh, more about how the conclusions can be generalized from our study uh, to a broader population or to other contexts. And, and, and this is an issue of making the task and situation more real in the experiments. Uh, because in experiments, we don't really care that much about the sample, whether the sample is representative, right? Uh, because again, due to the random, uh, random assignment of, 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 of uh, subjects, of participants. And in a correlational study, in a survey, we, we usually care more about whether the, the conclusion represents, can be generalized to the population we want to generalize to. So in, in the context of survey, uh, this is more of a question about uh, not only whether this task is, is real or not, but also your participants, the sample, is it representative of the population? But again, this is not such a problem if, if you have an experiment uh, with a control group with a randomized, uh, experiment, uh, randomized experiments. So again, let's take a look at each validity more, ca uh, more carefully, uh, focus actually focus mostly on internal validity. And uh, internal validity again is, is to extend how much the evidence actually can support our claim. So when we say this drug cures a disease or the training actually improves performance, are there other ways that performance could have been affected that we haven't, uh, the researchers failed to, to consider? The question becomes, are there other explanations or has these explanations be uh, accounted for, be taken into consideration? So we, uh, again, we, uh, in the experiments, we manipulate the, the independent variables by creating different groups or different conditions, and we observe the changes. So uh, to protect the internal validity of experiments is basically to make sure that the variable that we are interested in is the only plausible variable, okay? Is the only plausible cause for any kind of observed variation in the dependent variable. And which means that we have to eliminate other plausible causes or control for, like not just eliminate, or if you can't eliminate them, you have to integrate those variables into your experimental design. So this, this brings us to the uh, idea, uh, to the concept of, of confounds or confounding variables. So these are sometimes called uh, extraneous variables that are not the focus of the study, but they provide alternative and plausible explanations to the effects, right? And if there are exist confounds that the experimenters fail to consider, and that undermines your internal validity of, this, of, your, of your research. So making, uh, that makes the, the, the effect that you're claiming less valid. So the confounds usually uh, are, are created, like if you look at the participants between conditions, are they different in some unintended way 
from uh, those in, the, in another condition, right? Actually, I should change that uh, to just delete the lower bit. Right, so the intended way is, is the independent variable. Uh, for example, if we want to test a new drug, we can randomly assign participants into two groups, right? And uh, uh, we can have a pre-treatment, pre-drug treatment measure whether to how depressed they are, right? So if we want to test, so like if say we want to test a new drug uh, and its effect on depression, and then we can have say a treatment of uh, 10 times a week, the, the participants in the a 10 week treatment that in the, in the treatment group, they take the drug or take the medication and in the no, no treatment group, in the control group, they don't take any medication. And well, we have post-treatment measurement and uh, saying that uh, those in the experimental group are less depressed than the, the, those in the control group. Okay. So uh, this is uh, basically, uh, th this is the, if, if you, uh, again, what we're doing here is drawing claims from our evidence and this is our claim, uh, this is our evidence. And imagine that claim is that uh, the medication reduces depression. So there's some kind of a causal effects between taking the medication and the depression uh, reduction. So if you look at this evidence, you, you, you ask yourself basically, are there any other explanations, right? That can actually explain this claim, the reduction of depression other than the medication itself. Right, so, so if we if we look at this this evidence more carefully, you would ask that uh, you would notice that not only uh, those in the experimental uh, condition uh, have the because uh, if we say that the drug is effective, we we basically talk about the the chemicals in the drugs have some kind of a bio neurological re reaction in your body that reduces depression. But uh, since that's the case. So you can ask that, uh, could it be that uh, depression improved over time, right? Uh, but no, because we have a control condition, we have a pretreatment in the control condition. So uh, because we have the pretreatment, uh, we have established that in, the, in, the, in, the, in both conditions, they are depressed or they're equally depressed before the treatment. And there's a difference after treatment that eliminates the explanation that depression could improve over time. So it must have something to do with taking the medication, right? But it could also be that uh, the patients in the two conditions are a little bit different from each other, but, but if there's random assignment again, uh, these participants are not really different from each other because uh, their difference is random, right? And then there's also we kind of established there's no difference in terms of depression and the pretreatment measure. But again, the most important factor here uh, procedure here is the random assignment of the participants. And if you look a bit closer, we realize that uh, in, in, in the control condition, they didn't take any medication at all. So, but, so could it be that taking, med medic med taking the medicine instead of the medicine itself, which means that the, uh, the chemical uh, ingredients of the medicine have actually reduced, the, reduced depression. So this is very commonly known as, as the placebo effect. Right, so so the placebo effect is basically the unintended effect of just being participating in a part of the study. It could be that taking the drug itself has a psychological effect, and so the placebo effect is usually explained uh, understood as a psychological effect. And in some cases, you have a quite large placebo effect. So in order to control the placebo effect, you have the control group take a, take a placebo drug that has no active uh, chemical ingredient that presumably take the, uh, can reduce depression. So that you eliminate the alternative explanation that it is taking the drug itself instead of the drug, but the action of experiencing of taking the drug that reduces the, the, the depression. So there are other, this is placebo effect is just one of the many threats to internal validity that are, that are quite common in a lot of the studies. And uh, the, the other ones, including such experimental effect, uh, demand characteristics, which is part of the uh, type of experimental effect, uh, the order effect, right? 
So which means that there's practice and learning effect that causes difference between conditions, especially if you have a within subject design where participants can go through all the conditions. Uh, there's also selecting by selection bias, which means that there are pre-existing differences, uh, change or development in participants that have such as history, right? History in fact refers to, you know, during the studies, especially you have a pre-post uh, measurement, then uh, during the between pre and post measure, uh, post treatment measurement, some sort of crisis happened, like I don't know, pandemic crisis happened, that could changes the outcome of the study. There's also the growth of participants, or there's also attrition or, or mortality of participants. Not that they've died, but they've they've quit the study, because in a lot of studies, participants are 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 free to withdraw from the study. So if certain participants, if participants with certain kind of traits uh, withdraw from the study, so if there's some kind of systematic pattern in those uh, withdrawing from the, from the study, then you would end up with, uh, uh, then your results will be affected by the survivorship bias in that those participants who survived in the long run they have some kind of uh, differences from systematic differences from those who didn't survive, not only because of uh, the treatment. There's also some st statistical confounds such as regression towards mean, that we, which we will talk about later. So let's talk about, uh, let's look at each of them a little bit more carefully. Uh, so the experimental effects, for example, if you have, if you have the same study, uh, about the drug and depression, uh, anti-depression drugs, and then if the uh, if the post-treatment assessment of depression is uh, is uh, assessed by some kind of observer, okay, and the observer based on the uh, so let's say that you have interviews of these patients uh, from from the observer, and they have some, based on these interview notes. Uh, the observer kind of code uh, judged these uh, participants as more or less depressed. So based on this findings, you say that the medication has reduced observed depression. Uh, but uh, if the interviewer, if the observer know which group has been treated, then he or she might be biased, right? Uh, in a way that uh, our perception is the perception is usually can be biased by our knowledge, right? And uh, you start to pay attention to this, to improvements, pay attention to the symptoms uh, that has been improved, and start to ignore the the signs that hasn't improved. Okay, so you start to engage some kind of a selective attention and selective processing of the information, uh, or you could ask select uh, biased questions that can induce. Uh, certain answers from the patients, right? Like, have you noticed an improvement? Are you feeling better now? These are uh, questions, one-sided questions that, that are uh, encouraging positive answers. So this is one way that uh, the, 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 the assessor might actually be biased. Okay, again, it's an experimental effect. If the experimenter happened to know what's going on, uh, who is the, in the treatment group, who is in the uh, control group, so to address this, uh, to, to to address this uh, this kind of uh, issue, we usually involve uh, engaging some kind of double-blind procedure, so that the participants and experimenter who is running the study they're blind to the to the conditions. So you can have random assignment, but uh, the experimenter uh, and the participants don't know which drugs they actually uh, they actually taking. So of course, there the are people who know about this, it's just that the, not the person who is actually administration uh, uh, giving out these drugs. And the researcher also uh, shouldn't know which one is which and participants shouldn't know. So this, this kind of double blind procedure reduces both placebo effect, right? Or, 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 experiment, or participation effect, you can call it that way. Uh, or, and all, as well, the experimenter expectation effect. There are also demand characteristics that come from these uh, cues in the study that might, uh, that might give them a cue to the participants about what the study is about. 
uh, this, this is uh, about the question whether uh, if participants know the purpose of the study, could, could it be that uh, they, they will change their behavior uh, in a way that, uh, that confirms the, or, or confirms the hypothesis or disconfirms the hypothesis. Uh, this can come from uh, about participants who can talk about rumor of, of the study, or uh, if, if you give participants a debriefing sheet and then they will show the debriefing sheet to, to the other future participants, or the location of the study, or there are other explicit or implicit cues, such as the word in, its, in, in the questionnaire, for example. People are, in general, kind of, if they want to, they can, uh, they can usually figure out what uh, self-report measures they're me or what, what they are measuring, right? And they, they can, based on this kind of a knowledge, start to change their responses in one way or another. So there are different ways of responding to these demand characteristics. Uh, there are participants who do not want to ruin the experiment, who try to play on or bad participant trying to disconfirm the hypothesis or to follow the instructions to the letter, the faithful participants, which actually is what we want. We want the participants to, to follow the instructions or uh, the apprehensive participants will behave in a socially desirable way. Uh, if your study is uh, say about racism and they will, they will sort of behave in a way that uh, that present themselves in the political correct way. So, to uh, addressing these uh, these issues, we can use disguise. We can we can try to not tell them the, the, the true purpose of the experiment from the very beginning, or we can use certain measures that are indirect infer uh, their not their, uh, the what we want to to assess instead of relying on. A, participant self-report. And there's also order effect, especially if you have a within subject design. Uh, for example, if you, if you want to uh, do, do study people's memory, right? And uh, memory performance, that if you first have face memory, then have voice memory, you find out that voice memory performed better in voice memory than face memory this way. And you, you can make the claim based on the evidence that say do people have better memory about voice than face. But the confound is clearly that uh, you need to, it could be that people uh, practice their memory in the first face memory task, so they perform better in the second task. So this kind of order effect is also carried over in fact from one condition to another. Uh, this is the, the biggest threat about it within subject designs. So this is usually uh, dealt with with some kind of counterbalancing. So you have uh, between subject conditions where you have a reversed order, uh, so that so that the, the effect of order can be taken into account. In this case, it's, it's counterbalancing, so they can cancel each other out. So you have the same kind of performance, and so it's like they always have a, a better performance on the second ta second task than the first task. And then you can, you can claim that there's no difference between voice and face memory because if you average it out, you, you realize that uh, the, the variation is basically caused by the order, not by the type of uh, task. There's also the regression towards the mean, which happens if you use some kind of pre-treatment or pre-treatment uh, uh, pre-measured performance to determine uh, control and the treatment groups. Uh, so the, this is a very classic example that you have the, the education program trying to test whether uh, this education program will, will teach a method will improve performance. So uh, what, what they did is that they have this pre-test and they are based on the, the test results. They uh, they divided children into the select children that performed high, which is about above 70, and performed low, which is below 30%, and as high performance, low performance group. And uh, they then uh, give you the new teaching method, and after, post, after this new teaching method, they found out that uh, those who have, were in the uh, high performance group have, improved, uh, have not improved, but actually their performance has decreased, and the low performance group have improved. 
So based on this evidence, they claim that, okay, the treatment only works for those in the low performance group. It doesn't work for those children who are in the high performance group. All right, so there's the evidence, uh, pre-post changes, like you can see that uh, that sounds quite similar to what we talked earlier, right? There's a pre-treatment measure, pre measurement, a post-treatment measurement, and then we observe some kind of change. But if we look at carefully, the, 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 you, you realize that the children are not, are not randomly assigned into, into these two groups. Instead, you have uh, some kind of a, a score that is, uh, that is determined both by random factor, which is luck, and ability, which is stable factor. So, and luck tend to even out from one time to another. So, which means that in the pretreatment selection, if you, if you select children based on 100% luck, let's put it into extreme, that you always get just build, build, based on pure random, uh, pure luck, uh, there are children who will perform better, there are children who will perform worse. Okay, so the next time luck tend to even out. So the regression towards me means that uh, those who perform in the 70, in the, in the, in the high performance group, because they're, in this case, it's, they're, they're, it's completely luck. Then in the next test, they will, uh, they will perform worse. So uh, they will become less lucky, and those in the f those who, the first time which are unlucky will, will become less unlucky, and then it will, will produce the same kind of a, a pattern of change as we have shown earlier, as if they, uh, they as if the uh, the teaching method has worked. So th what it really tells us is you should, you should try to use random assignment, right? So uh, do not use kind of a performance that involved. Uh, luck determining group membership. Uh, there are different types of experimental designs. Uh, let me just wrap it up before we go on to a break. Uh, there's quasi-experimental designs which uh, which don't have either don't have a control group but only have pre and post test, or post test only with a experimental and control groups, and sometimes a time series design. Uh, but the true experimental designs always have pre-test and post-test with both experimental and controlled groups. Uh, there are also different ways of uh, reducing the, of controlling for different kind of uh, different uh, factors. Uh, let's just take a break first and we come back in 10 minutes and we will we'll continue on this, okay? Going for a break, pause recording. Okay, welcome back. Uh, experimental design is extremely uh, complex topic. They are uh, courses just designed to discuss experimental, the different kinds of experimental designs in statistics. Uh, so we're not gonna go through all the possible experimental designs, but just gonna go through a few uh, basic ones as examples. Uh, so for example, uh, remember the uh, bias reduction interventions in our accent bias study. Let's say that we only have three levels that uh, for, the, for, for our intervention, uh, the two of them are treatment, and the third level is the control group, represented as X1, 2, and 3. If we have a completely randomized factorial design, uh, factorial means that it's treating that it as a factor, uh, and full experimental design, we we'll have a three interventions, three groups, but we also have pretest of bias and post-test of bias measures. So we have a, a completely randomized uh, pre-post design here. So any kind of uh, conclusion needs to be drawn by comparing across interventions, but also between uh, the changes between uh, from pre to post test. And this is uh, this doesn't include any kind of uh, uh, you, you notice that the only factor that's being considered here is the intervention. But what if we want to consider uh, start to consider other factors, uh, external factors that might have, have affect the, the output? So we want to uh, the outcomes. So we want to include them in our research design.
So one way is uh, through the so-called blocking. I'm going to put my blinds up a little bit so the light doesn't shine on my face. And it still shines on my face. Uh, right. So the, the blocking means that you, it's, it's, it's a technique that basically controls for other factors, such as including demographic variables and research materials, by basically creating uh, blocks across, uh, creating so-called blocks. Uh, but the observations within the same block, they're not really independent but usually they, have to, uh, they are correlated in some way, right? Uh, so let's say that uh, we want to uh, have a blocking factor called, called uh, firms, right? And we, have, we want to test the intervention, but we want to test it in different firms. And then we can have this, uh, not only uh, test, test this, this intervention, X1, 2, and 3, uh, into different firm types, actually blocking factor is firm types at x1, 2, and 3. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So then you, you, you create these nine different blocks by intervention and firm types. So firm within each, within each blocks, so they are random, uh, randomly assigned to a level of intervention. So uh, you have large firms and then uh, you randomly assign those large firms into like X1, 2, and 3. So now you create uh, firms as blocks, which means that during the analysis, you can tease out the effect of the size of the firms on your, your results. Uh, you, can, you can even look at, you can look at interaction between whether any intervention works better than some, for some firms or not, than other firms. Uh, basically, the idea is that once you've integrated into design, in the, in the analysis, you will be able to tease apart the variance that has been systematic variance has to be accounted for, can be accounted for by the size of the firm, making your estimation of the effect of the intervention more accurate. And there's also a, a more advanced blocking technique called a Latin square design, for example, uh, that allows you to control for two factors. Uh, but uh, the uh, restriction is that these factors needs to have the same level as the independent variable. And, uh, for example, if we, if we have two factors, uh, one is the accent of the candidate have three levels, and the other is the interview question that the candidate is being answered, right? So we want to, we want to control for these two factors in our design, and uh, in our design with the three treatment levels, uh, or two treatment levels and the control level. Now we can create a, a three by three Latin square where you have an interview question by uh, the accent. You could create nine different cells and then you, you put these uh, intervention X1, two and three into these cells in a way that uh, each, each, each combination is a unique combination out of the nine possible combinations. Okay, so uh, for example, for interview question A, well, if you look at this way, like on each row, you have a, a, you, you assign treatment one, two, and three to the three accent, accents, uh, such as receive pronunciation, multicultural London English, and leads. And then for interview question B, you have two, three, one. For question three, you have three, one, two. In this way, you basically using a, a nine, uh, using the cell, using nine cells, you have exhausted all the possible combinations between the interview question, treatment, uh, and the accent. Okay, so notice that uh, in order to, if we do a full factorial design, because each factor has three levels, if you want to create, if you want to exhaust all the, uh, all the different kind of uh, groups, we have to create uh, 27 different groups, right? In order to do, to do this. But in this case, we only need the nine cells, nine groups, to exhaust all the possible combinations and the control to actually tease apart the effect of, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of interview question and accent. So Latin square design is, is, a, is a way of, of saving, 
saving the uh, using uh, being efficient using a, a design of nine groups to achieve the effect of uh, to to be able to analyze it like it it's not exactly the same but you will be able to tease uh, tease a uh, tease out the effects of two uh, factors but with only nine groups instead of 20 27 groups because again as you, as, as you do the math it will be if you if you have three factors with each condi three uh, condition uh, three levels each you have to create 27 different groups if you have a full factorial design okay so what you mean is that the Latin square is really what we call incomplete design uh, for, similarly you can have uh, 16 cells to tease apart two factors of uh, four of four levels instead of 64 uh, groups right so the Latin square design is usually very efficient uh, we wouldn't have time to go through how the Latin square is created but if you're interested in it you can just use uh, use Google to find out how Latin squares are created for this kind of design and, and, and a complete design will require 64 conditions, right? So we need more, uh, more resource. So that's, that's some examples of, uh, of the experimental designs. But again, the key factor is that creating blocks, creating groups so that we could start to uh, create factors. So we can start to tease out the effect of certain factors in the analysis to make that possible. And external validity, we're not going to talk too much here, but it's basically how the findings are generalized, can be generalized to other research contexts, uh, such as from one lab to another or from lab to, to real world settings. And this is also sometimes referred to as e ecological validity, uh, which is, means that how much the material resembles what the material is uh, the real world. Uh, there's always some kind of trade-off between if you do lab experiments, you will have high internal validity because you have more precise control. But uh, meanwhile, you have lower external validity because usually lab experiments are carried out in artificial settings. And the measures are also a bit different from real world behaviors. And sometimes if you do field experiments or field studies, you have a bit high external validity. Uh, because it takes place in the real life settings, but then you have lower internal validity because the settings are less controlled. Uh, I'm not going to go much too much detail into correlational design because the, they're just uh, either you have because correlational design is often often a matter of statistical modeling, right? So the the, co the regression that we talked about earlier can be used to, to on any kind of correlational studies. And there are more complex uh, correlational designs, such as uh, uh, time series design or longitudinal design, which I'm not really an expert on. But the key about correlation design is that, it, the, and also its limitation, is that any kind of correlation that you found, is you cannot claim any kind of, although you want to claim causation, but uh, the correlation design cannot guarantee, cannot, uh, cannot guarantee uh, causal effects. Just an example that we used in the, in the previous lecture. Uh, we talked about how the, in the study of Clark, they, they find that uh, religiosity influenced violent crime in different countries, and the national level IQ seems to moderate that. So religiosity seemed to reduce violent crime, but only for those countries with the lower national level IQ. Again, the, the, these claims are made out of, uh, out of correlational data. So there's no manipulation. There's no no anything. You basically obtain these data from a third level, a third data. In this case, it's it's obtained through a third source, a third party, and then uh, it become and then they uh, they just draw this claim saying, okay, uh, religiosity is the independent variable and it, it it influences violent crime as if there's some kind of causal relationship. The problem is that a correlation is not causation. Which in this case, it doesn't mean that uh, there's a correlation between, only mean that the, it not only it, it means that, uh, that it could be that what you're looking at is just a correlation, but also that your, your entire model that this building here are become susceptible, susceptible to, um, 
to other additional analysis that take into consideration of other variables, right? So you, because you have this correlational data set, people can start to add on variables onto it based on what they know about these countries and start saying that, oh, okay, once you include other variables, then this whole correlation is not even there anymore. So for example, the, uh, the Schmack's uh, criticism of, of their study is basically saying that, okay, if we include racial inequality into the model, which is not considered in the original, uh, original uh, theoretical framework, if you put in racial inequality, then the, the both religios, uh, religiosity and the interaction that was previously significant, they became non significant anymore. So, what does that even mean? Does that mean that religiosity does not influence violent crime anymore? Does not mean that, but basically, what it means in a, in a statistical sense is that once you've included this predictor, it seems to be a better predictor, uh, it seems to add significantly to the other two predictors, right? And we, we already know that in terms of predicting violent crime. But that, that doesn't mean that uh, it is racial inequality that's causing the violent crime, nor is this religiosity. Right? So this is just bringing out the fact that uh, your model becomes vulnerable to uh, other interpretations once you have correlation of studies, especially when your data is from, uh, from uh, some kind of uh, uh, publicly available data, data, then people can add what they know about the countries and claim that this is uh, racial inequality is a better predictor than, of violent crime than religiosity. Okay, so that this is a particular problem with the correlation of designs, and not only because uh, statistic uh, uh, correlation is not causation, but also means that your your conclusions based on significance of the predictors becomes become vulnerable to the criticism of other people bringing additional uh, factors into the model, right? So to summarize this, uh, this is just a brief summary of what is internal and external validity and of research, okay? And again, any kind of research design is trying to maximize internal and validity. And usually people will value internal validity over external validity until, unless it is very important to to generalize to a population. In a lot of social science studies where, where they care more about these underlying processes, especially in psychology studies, where they really care about these psychological mechanisms and, and stuff like that, they usually uh, favor internal validity, trying to have better control uh, of, these, uh, uh, of the study over external validity that is gaining uh, a, a representative sample or having meaningful uh, meaningful task or meaningful research materials. Okay, now that's the question about uh, research validity and the basics about that. Uh, the next is the measurement of reliability and validity. And uh, we've talked about measurement a long time at the beginning of the, of the, of the entire course. And here it is just again. So, uh, so the measurement is just basically turning these, these underlying characteristics that we want to study, right? what we want to study into data. So uh, such as you, if you want to study weight, then you, you have to use some kind of measure to read weight into some kind of numeric numbers. And, and then the, the, what, what we have in data is always the result of some kind of measurement. So it's really important to keep that in mind and to understand what kind of measures that would be used to translate these real life, uh, real world phenomenon into numbers. And uh, the, valid, the idea of a valid measure is a little bit different from the idea of a valid experiment in that it, it is referring to what is it what measure and actually what is supposed to measure. Okay, so the way it works uh, should make some kind of sense. Try to not to sneeze. In order to establish the validity of the measure, scores and the, the idea of, of what is a valid measure is basically uh, you need to show some kind of meaningful correlation 
of the scores from this measure to some external criteria that it can also be observed. So if you say a thermometer is valid, means that the reading on the thermometer correlates with some kind of real life phenomenon or our, our own uh, sub, uh, physical ex, uh, subjective experience, such as how hot or cold it is, right? Uh, you can correlate uh, the zero, uh, you can correlate the temperature reading with the status of the water. You can have zero degree as the freezing point and a hundred degree as, as the boiling point. So, and as it increases, the temperature increases, you feel hotter and hotter to the point that it becomes difficult. So, uh, so the, what means that is the reading of the measure have to correlate to some kind of external criteria. And that's the basics of, of, uh, of uh, validating this measure. Okay. And we have different ways of, of measurement that we really didn't get to talk about. But all these, uh, the basic validity argument uh, applies to all this kind of different kind of measures. So you can, you can have observational measures, so you can have behavior codings of observing behavior and turn them into codes, uh, or uh, according to the themes, uh, you can count how many words one has used, uh, what kind of words have uh, one used in the conversation, and these are observational measures. And uh, uh, nowadays, thanks to, uh, you know, big data and the internet, uh, our daily activities online, for example, is being measured and recorded. Is in, in our behaviors in social media are being monitored and, 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 and recorded in these ways and being coded all the time to produce certain uh, predictions and to, and to be used in all kinds of purposes, such as marketing. Uh, and then in psychology, we have, uh, have these self-report measures, uh, which is, yeah, it's just simple. How much do you like something? For example, it, it's based on your self-report, reported, uh, how do I say, self-reported behavior, right? You basically make a judgment according to certain instruction, right? So like if you a measure of attitudes, you will report how much you like, in this case, Trump or Bunny, or uh, uh, the concept of narcissism, you can self-report by choosing a statement that you agree with more, such as if I rule the world, it would be a better place, or the thought of ruling the world frightens the hell out of me, right? And, and those who are more likely to choose the, the first statement or agree with the first statement, uh, statement more, we call it a, a narcissism. But again, it has to be correlated with some other kind of narcissistic behaviors that we can agree on. Uh, in this case, for example, uh, there's another example of, of uh, agree, agreeableness. This is one of the so-called big five personality dimensions. Uh, you respond, you, you basically, evaluate yourself against these statements in terms of agreement. Uh, and then if you agree with certain of these behaviors, you are more likely to be showing a high level of agreeableness. There are also more implicit measures now in social psychology nowadays and, uh, that uh, uses the, this kind of indirect and seemingly uh, irrelevant task that ask you to do uh, some kind of a completely irrelevant task that indirect, indirectly measures your, uh, your attitudes towards certain uh, objects. Uh, as an example, uh, here I present a, uh, a demonstration of the evaluated priming task, which asks you to, you'll see uh, this cross, uh, the fixation point, uh, followed by an image and then followed by a target word. So the talk, your task is basically to judge this target word as either a good word or, or a bad word. And so the task is relevant to the attitudes that we are actually trying to measure, but it is actually judging the target word. So you will see why, what do I mean by it is an indirect measure. So if you, uh, so let, let's complete a few trials of this uh, evaluative priming task. And your, again, you, you should pay attention to the target word. 
So basically, if it's a good word, you say good, or if it's a bad word, you say bad. Okay. So just actually try to do that behind the screen. So do not pay attention to the picture. Pay attention to the word. Okay. So this is very clear. You should try to ignore the picture. Try to focus on the word. So you, if you're ready, I'm going to present you the first trial. So you say it's supposed to say good, right? So so how fast or slow can you say good is the key here. So you should say, if you say it's if you see the word say good as fast as possible, right? So the second trial, right? Good, right? bad, bad, right? good. So. So that's the idea. So basically what's recorded here is the reaction time of you judging those uh, words. But the idea is that you can indirectly infer attitudes towards those pictures, which is in this case, uh, Bunny and Trump. If you love Bunny, you'll be faster in judging those uh, pleasant words following the Bunny picture. And if you dislike Trump, you will be faster judging uh, negative words or uh, after, after seeing Trump. So by, by uh, coding, uh, by calculating how f relatively fast or slow you, you respond to these words following these two different primes, we get some kind of indirect measure of how much you like Trump over Bunny. Uh, and uh, so the reason that we use implicit measures is to overcome the problem of, uh, of that we have dealt with, uh, we have briefly addressed earlier in that, in the self-report measure, you're more likely to control your your out uh, control your responses in a way that is either socially desirable or that's desirable, like according to your understanding of the purpose of the study. Okay? So especially when you have sensitive questions. So so but so also sometimes you are difficult to report uh, your preferences. For example, you might be confused uh, about whether you like Trump or a bunny. Right, or you might be unwilling to report it because you don't want to tell your friends that you actually voted for Trump. So, so uh, these implicit measures are supposed to uh, overcome these motivations to control your responses and give you a more a kind of a, a assessment of what's your gut feelings or what automatically happens or happens quickly. And you can also see that self-report measures, or in this case, it's a questionnaire of Rosenberg's self-esteem questionnaire. It contains multiple items uh, across, uh, self-esteem measures in particular has 10 items. And uh, it also has, uh, as this form of response is basically you show agreement or disagreement with these statements. And uh, that's, that's called the Likert measure. Is it called Likert measure, Likert measure? I think it's Likert. So Likert measure is, is a type of rating method that's really common in social science. And it's straightforward enough. You basically have a target statement and a scale of one to five or of other, uh, other points of, other, uh, points of response uh, and indicate the levels of agreement by selecting one of the numbers. So, but also you can have other kinds of responses, uh, such as the semantic differential measure, which you are judged uh, about the judge target with a, a scale with two semantically op opposed opposite anchors, such as uh, whether you think a panda is ugly versus cute, a light versus heavy, like that. So these are just two examples. And you can have different dimensions of ratings in the self-report measures. Again, this is uh, this is mostly psychology stuff, right? But also like other, if you use surveys, this is also relevant. You can uh, you can have ratings of agreement, how frequent, how important, or, or how much, or how good or poor is it, how likely or unlikely is it to happen, how satisfied you are, or value. You might wonder how many points do you need for a agreement measure? For example, if you measure agreement. Well, it depends on your researcher's uh, interest and objective, but uh, the utility of uh, items rate greater than five. If you use more than five, uh, five point scales has been shown that the, the utility will be little of having more than five points of responses. So five point is a, is a good starting point, let me just say, right? 
So we've met, we've talked about uh, validity, which is what measures it's supposed to measure. And there's also reliability is whether, whether the measure can produce consistent results over unchanged conditions. So if you, if you imagine a ruler that measures the same object under the same temperature and all the other conditions, if the ruler gives a different kind of reading, slightly differs all the time, and then depends on how much it differs, uh, we can say whether the ruler is reliable or unreliable. And again, uh, there are ways of establishing reliability and, and validity for, for measures. So the type, there are different types of reliability uh, that we looked at. The first is that it should be reliable over time. The second is that you ha if you have multiple items, such as the one that I showed earlier in the, in the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, if you have 10 items, then you should have a, what I call internal consistency is that a different item should be correlated, the scores from different items. And if the scores are from different scorers, then you should have a interrater reliability, which means that different scorers should have reliable, should have similar uh, scores on the same target. So to, to for example, uh, test and retest reliability, we know that self-esteem of persons is uh, known to be more stable over time. So therefore the scores at the time one and time two with the same sample, again, these suggest that the, the, the construct that you are, you are assessing is unchanged, right? So you have the same sample and if you know that the same sample should have similar reliability, then if you do a scatter plot, then you, should, you can, or, or just simple correlation, then you can have a correlation of uh, the time one and time two scores on the same sample. Uh, if it's high, then it's have, uh, it has a high test retest reliability. Okay. So a rule of thumb is that you should have a correlation of larger than 0 0.80 to indicate good test and retest reliability. Internal consistency. So which means that if you have different items measure the same construct because uh, because uh, a, a, construct, uh, a measure with more items are more, in general, better, right? And the scores on all these different items should be highly correlated, okay? So for example, for Rosenberg self-esteem scale, you have three diff these different items, such as on the whole, I'm satisfied with myself. I feel that I have a number of good qualities, or I take a positive attitude toward myself. Again, these are different worded items and they're clearly different in terms of contents. So they're different items, but uh, reactions to these items should correlate, okay? So that when you aggregate the scores of these items, it, it aggregates to measure the same construct that is self-esteem, uh, that is self-esteem. You also have these reversed, reversely scored uh, items such as uh, uh, agreement on these items will indicate low self-esteem, right? So what you would do to calculate uh, internal consistency is that you, first of all, you have to, you have to uh, re-score these items, uh, reverse coded items, in the, in the, so that the, the, the direction of the score uh, of all different, uh, on all different items of the same measure are consistent. So that higher scores means higher self-esteem. Okay, which means that you have to reverse score those uh, rever uh, reversely worded items, negatively worded items. So there are different statistic methods to, uh, to establish internal consistency. Uh, you have the split half method, uh, basically split a measure into two halves, and then like odd, odd, uh, odd even item split, for example, odd, odd numbered items versus even numbered items. And then you do a correlation between these two, uh, two halves. Uh, the scores from the two halves, right? Or you can do what we call the Cronbach's alpha. Uh, conceptually speaking, the Cronbach's alpha is just the average of all the possible split half correlations for a set of items. So there are 252 ways of split the 10 items in Cronbach's alpha. It's just like the average of these 252 split half correlations. And the actual way that's been estimated in a math equation is not the same as actually uh, doing the average of 252 different correlations. It's more like using some kind of a, uh, some kind of analysis of variance methods uh, for that. 
So I think for that regard, we should try to uh, demonstrate how the curl box alpha is calculated in SPSS uh, so that you could uh, actually, so if you're using some kind of a measure in the future, you can easily just calculate it in SPSS. So for that, I'm going to uh, bring up this, uh, this data that I have shared with you earlier. It's a very uh, simple and small data. It's just a few items that if you remember that the, uh, that the data that you did in your very first uh, lecture, uh, that we had this, uh, this data set. Just realized I forgot to name it. So I should name it lecture 10 Chromebox off or something. So these are uh, still your responses to some of the questions that I asked you about, uh, that I asked you uh, during the very first lecture. Again, I'm not sure what exactly is the construct being assessed here, but I think it has to do with beliefs about uh, uh, so-called liquid ability in that uh, your kind of uh, your ability would change you if you work harder or not and you can see that these items some of them are in the same direction some of them are in a, in a different direction and that these are just the participants responses and participants being you so like let's let's just put in the participant participant uh, so participant uh, ID variable here to indicate these are from different participants. So we have 18 responses from each of you. So we have a measure of one, two, three, four, five, five items, right? And these are uh, made on a seven uh, on, a, on a seven point scale. Okay, let me just quickly blow my nose. If you read these items, you get a feeling of some of them are in the same direction, some of them are in the, in the opposite direction. For example, you can always change the basic qualities that define who you are. That's in the same direction. The harder you work at any skill, the better you will be at it. Uh, that's the opposite direction toward, uh, against the, uh, compared to the important parts of you cannot be changed because this is about things can't be changed, right? So this, this needs to be reverse coded. I, I put R after that to indicate this can be reverse coded. Trying new things is stressful for me. That also indicates that, that could be that you know, you're, you're less open to change or you think things don't change. I think these two measures, these two items D and E are actually two uh, are from a different, for a different dimension of the same measure. So different items in the same measure could measure different dimensions, right? I got angry when receiving feedback about my, about my performance. That can also indicate uh, a lack of uh, a lower lack of openness. So we give it this also reverse coded, right? So we now have five items. Now we just have to copy and paste these data into a uh, into SPSS, which I'm about to do. Uh, I'm just going to share the whole desktop with you. SPSS, new data. Okay, so we have the new data set here. Just copy and paste it. So now we have these data set in SPSS. And the first one, which is called the participant's PID. And uh, from the item, I, I'm just calling these items, item one, item two. And item three. Item four, item five. Now, in order to uh, remind yourself what needs to be recorded, uh, reverse coded, coded uh, so three, four, and five seems to be in the opposite direction. Scoring seems to be opposite, opposite direction as 
item one and two. So the next step will be we have to produce a, a reverse score of these items because SPSS don't do that for us when we are doing the uh, Chromebox offer analysis. So let's close that. It's just going to use the whole use SPSS. To reverse code, you need to compute variable or recode into different variables. You can compute variable because we have a seven point scale. We can easily just compute the opposite score by using eight to minus the response scores, right? So seven become one, uh, six become two. So uh, you can also recode into different variables, which is going to be more difficult. What about automatic recode? I've never tried this item before. I've never tried this option before. I'm just gonna use compute variable. So uh, I'm gonna call the target variable, let's call the item three R. So it indicates that's reverse coded. Uh, we're just gonna use set eight minus item three. Again, seven become one, six become two. So it's eight minus the score. Uh, if we paste that, uh, we'll be able to reuse the the syntax so that we can calc easily just calculate the other three as well. So now we have four uh, r equals eight minus item four. Uh, we can have five r equals eight minus item five. So now we have this. Uh, we calculate. We run the selection. Now we have a uh, uh, reverse coded item three, four, and five. Again, it's highly recommended that you don't do anything to the original scores and keep the original scores as what they are. So you have an original record, and you know what the R's mean, it's reverse coded of these items, right? So, it, and in the future, if you want to calculate the aggregated scores of, uh, let's say, openness to change or beliefs about change, you would, you would use the reverse coded scores. Why is it eight again? So it, it one because so we have a seven point scale from one to seven, right? The scale is differs from the score we're gonna get is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We want to turn seven into one. So that's reverse coding, right? Seven become one, six become two, five become three. So uh, eight minus seven equals one. That, that's the easier ways of reverse coding it. Otherwise you have to say reverse code six become two. That's equivalent of using eight minus six equals two. But why is it, that's why we use eight for that. Uh, so now we use, uh, to do Chromebox Alpha, we have to do it analyze. There's a there's an item called a scale. All right. So the scale, there's a reliability analysis. Okay, so you have to do that. And, uh, and then the next step is just have to, uh, so you have all these different models, alpha, split half, parallel, strict parallel, Goodman. We're gonna use alpha. We just have to enter the items that are scored in the same direction into this reliability analysis, right? So that's one, two, three, four, five, or both reverse coded. In the statistics we have, we can have uh, some interesting statistics such as the scale if item deleted, right? So that's interesting. That will tell us that how much uh, would improve our Chromebox Alpha if we remove an item from the scale. We can also have it for item and scale. You can have inter-item correlations. So to see how much these items actually correlate with each other. You can also have some uh, means, variance, and you have ANOVA table. Uh, as I said earlier, the Chromebox Alpha is actually used, used some kind of ANOVA. So you can actually ask, ask for the F test and there are all the other different way, uh, different statistics, but we just could click these. Actually, I, I've never clicked these and over tables, so I, I'm curious about what we'll see as well. So if you paste that, again, the best practice is always to save uh, the paste. So now you have a reliability here. You can, you can double check the items that has been included. So if you, if you run that, And the output is usually, where is my output? So, here. Yeah. 
okay? So it gives us the overall Cronenbach hypo is 0.46, which is really uh, not so great. We have the inter-item correlation matrix. You can see how these items are correlated across the ten uh, across these items. And then at the end, you can see this little bit. It's called a Cronbox Alpha. If in the item total statistics, you can see the Cronbox Alpha if an item has been deleted. You can see if that if we delete item three and item two, it seems to be it will improve the chrome box off a little bit. Okay, Point, uh, you, deleting item three R will, will improve the chrome box off to to point five five. You can also notice that the the third item, which is the harder you work at your scale, the better you will uh, no, the trying new things will become stressful for me. It doesn't really, it doesn't really co converge in terms of content with the other two. So it might actually make sense to delete one of the items like 3R, right? So it shows you uh, how would you improve your Chromebox Alpha. Then you can, based on that, and your, I don't know, theoretical, uh, value, uh, theoretical constructs, uh, well, your theoretical thinking to delete all these scores, uh, to, to delete all these items. So someone asked in the chat that, uh, are we assuming that there's a zero value? No, we are not assuming there's a zero value. The value that we're getting are completely arbitrary. Uh, it's actually, on, on, it's only, uh, it's not a racial measure. It's, it's a more of a it's a, it's a, it's, we all know that seven is higher than six, six higher than five, or that. So, so it's an ordinal scale, as we would call it. Uh, but it does not have a zero value anywhere. So the, the, the value of these measures, which I forgot to mention, are completely arbitrary. We know that higher level of agreement is higher than lower level of agreement, but there's no zero level of agreement. So that these these uh, uh, the the data that we that we acquire from these self-report measures are usually based on the completely arbitrary metrics. Uh, okay, the metrics does not make the values the metrics that is the, the actual number we assign usually doesn't make any kind of real world sense. We don't know like self-esteem. We don't know how much uh, what does five self-esteem of a uh, hundred means relative to self-esteem of ninety. We know that. 90 has a high, higher self-esteem than, uh, than 80. But we don't know that whether, uh, what do these differences mean? And what do they actually refer to in the real world behaviors such as depression or uh, pride or any of that? Okay, that's, that's, that's just, just reality with psychological measures, self-report measures that we got from questionnaires. So that's a very good question uh, about the zero value. So we, we, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Okay? So this is how you acquire Chromebox Alpha. And there are actually uh, analysis of variance. So based on this, we, it seems to make sense to delete one of the items. But usually, you already know what set of items that you want to test. And usually, you can use this for item selection, but that's not really recommended. Right? But this is just how to show you how to get the Chromebox Alpha. So that's how you get to Chromebox Alpha and SPSS. Uh, we're running out of time, so we're just going to go over this really quickly. An integrated reliability can also be calculated from Chromebox Alpha or Cohen's Kappa if you have categorical judgments. So uh, I'm not gonna go through those, just knowing that those are the options available to you. Uh, the second uh, issue is measurement validity, which I realize we um, might not have time to go through this, and this is actually quite important. So let's take a break and come back in 10 minutes, and we'll go, go to measurement validity, okay?
Pause the recording. All right, guys, uh, welcome back. Well, this is the last bit, uh, but there's something that's really important that I forgot to include in when I was measuring measurement. And thanks to the you who, uh, who pointed out, asked the question about whether there's a zero, uniform zero point uh, that reminds me of actually putting it up there. It, which is the level of measurement and uh, the level of measurement score. Uh, the different measurements can produce different types of scores and the scores have uh, their own proper, different levels of measurement have their own properties and what you can do mathematically to the score that they produced. So there's nominal, and the four levels of measurements are nominal, which is basically categorical data. And then uh, there's ordinal, uh, then interval, then ratio, which all can be uh, what we all fall into the category of, of quantitative data. But the meaning of these scores, uh, the, these level uh, of, of measurements are, uh, of scores, at different levels of measurements are different. And again, the things that you can do to these scores are different. So for ordinal scores, well, for categorical scores, basically categorical, you can't do any additional measures to it. But for ordinal scores, you have these ordered categories that uh, the order of scores makes sense, but the difference between the two values are not meaningful at all. So you can, you can interpret the scores in terms of uh, higher or lower, but the difference between seven and six, for example, is not meaningful. So you cannot say that a strongly disagree, between, the difference between strongly agree to agree is the same as the difference between agree to slightly agree. So although, although both differences in terms of uh, numerical values are one, which is seven from six and six from two five, but you cannot interpret as, as the differences scores are equal. Okay, that's, that's what you can do with ordinal measures. Most of the single items in, in the uh, self-report measures that I've showed earlier are ordinal scores. Uh, but if you aggregate them, if you aggregate across 10 different uh, items, then that psychologist are trying to hope uh, hoping that the scores that getting from aggregating multiple ordinal scores can get, get into the realm of interval measures. So interval measures are, uh, for example, uh, if you have a, a temperature in terms of uh, Celsius or actually Fahrenheit, both Fahrenheit and Celsius, uh, these have the properties of ordinal scales in that uh, 30 degrees higher than 20 degree. But now they also the difference between the two values are equal, are like are become meaningful. So you can say that the difference between 20 to 10 degrees is the same as the difference between 10 to 10 to zero degree. Okay. So this again usually requires some kind of a calibrating, calibration uh, of these scores from these measures to some kind of a real world criteria to in order to uh, obtain that. Uh, SAT score, for example, has been standardized and calibrated in a way that the scores uh, between 600 to 700 is the same from 700 to 800, okay? But uh, the, the key here is that the, the, the zero here is that they don't have a meaningful zero point. A meaningful zero point is only, uh, even for the Celsius degree or Fahrenheit degree, the zero, a, a zero, uh, a score of zero does not mean the absence of temperature. Okay? Only if you translate uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit into Kelvin degree, Kelvin temperature, uh, can you say that if there's absolute zero, which is the ab absence of all temperature, which means that there's absence of uh, I don't know, atom activities or anything, that kind of, a, so there's a physical definition of a zero, absolute zero. But Celsius, uh, for the Celsius, uh, degree uh, temperature, a score of zero, doesn't mean the absence of temperature. So that brings us, uh, uh, in terms of measure, there's some examples, right? Uh, so that's the temperature. But the, uh, if you have a meaningful zero point, then your score, then the score is, is on a ratio measure. So it's like a ratio uh, level of measurement. So ratio scores have all the properties of interval scores, but they also have an absolute zero, zero indicating that there's none, there's absence of the, of the property that's being measured. So a, a zero of, on the weight means that there's absence of weight 
a zero in terms of length means so there's absence of length. Okay, and in this case, the ratio of two scores, now you can, you can say that two kilograms is twice of weight of, uh, of one kilogram, which previously you cannot say that 20 degrees twice as the degree of, uh, of, of twice of temperature as 10 degree. Okay, that makes sense. You can say the difference between 20 and 10 is the same as the difference between 10 and, 10 and zero, but you cannot say that 20 degree indicates twice, twice the temperature as 10 degree. So with the ratio measure, you're able to do ratio calculations such as the one that's shown on the screen. So that, that answers the point about whether there's a meaningful zero point. So if you get a scores from an item in a, in a cell report scale, there is no meaningful zero point, okay? There's no absence of self-esteem. Uh, again, psychologists are, trying, are struggling to get into the scores, into the interval, to, to, to suggest that their scores are interval scores. Okay, let alone racial scores. Actually, it, it's a huge issue in, in the psychological science, in, like in psychology, that uh, the scores that you get from these questionnaires uh, are not calibrated according to real world behaviors. That's a big problem, especially a lot of, in a lot of social psychology constructs like self esteem. So, uh, so you cannot say that a self esteem, for example, uh, ideally you'll be able to tell that. Uh, a self-esteem of average of uh, 60 means that uh, this person have, I don't know, 60% of likelihood of staying in a difficult task once the task reaches a certain level, right? And then it's higher than a, a score of 50, which you can also assign a probability of this person staying, because you know, higher self-esteem is you're more confident, you're more likely to stay in the task, which is really difficult as the task getting more difficult. But this kind of a metric calibration as they have done in physics on the temperature, uh, on, on a thermometer, for example, is largely absent in psychology. So psychology basically in terms of uh, interpretation, usually uh, which one is higher in terms of higher scores or lower scores or correlations, but they don't know what this, they are actually correlated uh, against. Okay? I mean, there are some research showing that giving you categorical evidence saying high self-esteem is more likely to do this and low self-esteem is more likely to do, to do that. But there's no more calibrated, more quantitative calibration. And that's what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying. Uh, in your field, it might be different, right? It depends on what kind of data you get. But all the data you will fall into these four levels of measurement, uh, and then it would, it would dictate what you can do with the measure, what, what, what you can do with the data. All right, so that's, that's the case for psychological tests and questions. Uh, okay, let's continue with the, the topic on measurement validity. Uh, there are basically validity asks the question whether the measure uh, gives you the, the measure as the construct you set the measure. Okay? Does it serve its purpose? So there's face validity, I ask do items look valid, content validity, and criteria validity. And face validity is basically uh, looking at item uh, quality of the item. So uh, you can ask, it's, sometimes it's determined by the item quality. If, if you construct the item in a way that has certain gaps, such as in this case, in three to four hours, uh, it's not really, the items are not, the responses are not really uh, exclusive to each other, then you will get bad face validity, right? And also you have the question like, how satisfied are you with the coffee and lunch in Dreadnought building, which is the building I'm working in. But then because you are double barreling the question with both coffee and lunch, you're getting some kind of ambiguity there in, in the question. So face validity can sometimes tell by just judging, uh, first of all, whether the, the item measured what it seems to measure what it's supposed to measure. Also, do you have high quality items, which is clear and ambiguous items in terms of meaning and in terms of, in terms of options. Uh, for example, uh, self-esteem, they can, they can have a high face validity if you have the question that I feel that I have a good number of good qualities. And if you just measure someone's index finger and saying that's an indicate, indication of self-esteem, then it's, it's a, have a low face validity because it doesn't really make sense to, to correlate with one finger size to, uh, to, to self-esteem but not according to Trump, but uh, 
But then you have, and in this case, you actually have a very reliable measure, right? Which means that if you repeatedly measure one sub uh, index finger, it's going to be reliable readings, but it's completely invalid in, in terms of measuring self esteem. But sometimes face validity can be uh, wrong in that uh, in the sum of psychological measures, a lot of the items don't have any face validity. So in, the, the, in this case, there's the so called Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory too. It's very, uh, it's, they use this a lot in clinical psychology. So you have some items, so it's called a suppression of aggression, like anger control problems. And uh, uh, these items uh, are completely lack of face validity, such as I enjoy detective or mystery stories, or the sight of blood doesn't frighten me or make me sick. Uh, but what has been found is that these uh, agreement of these on these items correlates with uh, anger control problems. Again, uh, don't uh, even ask me about like uh, the, me the meaningful scores like one to 10. It just basically, it shows that there's some kind of a correlation going on. So these items can be used, right? In this inventory to, in order to identify people with anger control problems. But if you just look at these items itself, it's hard to, to make sense of how they can be correlated uh, how they are uh, related to uh, anger control. So which brings us to the, uh, to the idea of content validity, which is the, the, do the items in the measure cover the construct of interest? Uh, in psychology, for example, they, they usually say attitudes as different components like thoughts, feelings, and actions, and then a measure of attitudes based on this theoretical construct that attitudes should be like have these three components, so your measure should also have these three components as well. And this is usually uh, done by uh, criteria validity. So that, that's content validity. And this is usually done by having experts looking at the uh, experts about this construct to look at the, uh, the measures to see if these, cons uh, these uh, dimensions of the, uh, of the of, of construct is being covered. But this is usually judged by, the, by experts. There's no quantitative way of determining content validity. But what could be statistic, statistically determined is the criterion validity, which asks the question, does the measurement score correlate with an existing criterion? And we, well, as we already know, that this is really the golden standard for any kind of measures, because basically what, whether a measure is useful or, or valid, is determined by the scores and the correlation between the scores and the thing that you want to measure, right? So if you have a test anxiety measure, for example, and you find it to be negatively correlated with test performance, that could indicate that your test anxiety measure is valid. So this uh, criteria means that any kind of external variable that, uh, that are reasoned that are reasonable uh, for, for good reasons that should be correlated with the construct, such as if you, if you have a measure of text, test anxiety and you know that blood pressure is correlated with anxiety, then you can correlate test anxiety scores with the blood pressure in the exam, right? And uh, if you have a measure of physical risk-taking, then you should, can correlate it with risk-taking behaviors such as snowboarding. And there are different types of criteria of validity. Uh, if if the, the measurement and the criteria are collected at the same time, it's called concurrent validity. If it's uh, collected at different times and with the measurement collected before the behavior criteria, not have to be behavior criteria, it is called predictive validity. If the criteria is another measure of the construct, such as if you have self uh, if you develop a self esteem measure of your, of your own, you will be measuring the correlation between your measure and the Rosenberg self esteem measure, which is the gold, golden uh, criterion for explicit self esteem. So if this is the case, it is called convergent validity. There's also the case of discriminant validity, which is looking at the scores of a measure should be uncorrelated with the measures of construct that are conceptually distinct. For example, if self-esteem should be different from mood, 
if these are completely uh, uh, conceptually distinct, distinct uh, constructs, then the scores from these two measures, we expect them to be uncorrelated. And that's, that's it about a measurement reliability and uh, validity. So if you, if you want to put it into a, a diagram, then uh, this target diagram is really the, the one. So reliable measures produce consistent scores that are clustered together, and valid measures can hit the target. If you have an unreliable but valid measure, then you, on average, you hit the target, but your scores are all over the place. If you have a reliable but not valid measures, then you are reliably missing the target. So a, a reliable and valid measure means that you consistently hit the target. Right? So that's one way to understand the issue of validity and reliability in the, in the, measure, in the measures. Okay, so uh, that's it for the, for the whole, uh, whole course. Uh, we really, uh, so here's a quick review of what we have done uh, in the course. Uh, the whole course is mostly focused on this whole procedure, right? We talked about uh, data production and the data taken from of a sample from a population. And with the data, before we can do any kind of statistical inference, we can do what we call exploratory data analysis. So using graphs, using uh, statistics, descriptive uh, statistics to understand the data a little bit better. And the data production process involves sampling and also involves measurement. So uh, the data is produced by measuring uh, the sample. Right? And also another part of, of the, uh, data production is the research design. So we design the data, data pr pr production process in a way to make sure that the data can answer our research question. And the data can actually answer the, our research question unambiguously without any kind of confound. Right? So we, we kind of systematically design ways of research design in order to produce high quality data that addresses our research questions. Which is, And then uh, remember that our explore, exploratory data analysis focus on the sample data. But what we want to do is make a inference to the population. So in order to accomplish that, we use the tool called probability that allow us to make certain kind of statistical inference. inference. And that there are two types of statistical inference. One is uh, making an estimation about a population. The other is test hypothesis about a population. So that's, that's all that we have uh, learned mostly in this, uh, in our course. So from lecture one to lecture five, we basically mostly focused on uh, exploratory data analysis and probability. And then from lecture six to lecture nine, we focused on uh, estimation, uh, we focused on stati statistical inference, uh, inference uh, which either you make estimation about a population in terms of point estimation or confidence interval, or you test hypothesis about the relationships between variables in the population. So here's the, uh, a quick uh, summary about how to explore the, the, the relationships between two variables. Again, the most important thing you look at is uh, whether this is a categorical variable or whether this is a quantitative variable. So different types of independent and dependent variable would utilize, would utilize different way of depict, depicting uh, the data. For example, for a quantitative quantitative relationship, you can use scatter plots. Okay. And here's a summary of uh, Testing the, relationship, testing the relationship between two variables. Uh, we've talked about chi-square test, 
in the, the case of whether you have categorical and quantitative, categorical independent variable and a quantitative dependent variable such as experiments, we, we can use t-test or we can use uh, analysis of variance. And it, we know that in the analysis of variance, not only can we look at uh, two in, uh, one independent variable, we can look at more than one, such as two independent variables, by looking at their interactions. And at the end, we spent uh, almost two lectures looking at the quantitative quantitative relationship, which we have correlation ana analysis and also regression analysis, which I'm pretty sure I put there, but I'm not sure why it's not there. So I'm just going to put there. And these are all, uh, and for regression analysis, we looked at multiple regression, which we include more than one independent variables. And again, we can look at their interactions by including an interaction term uh, in, by including the, the, the product term of two variables in the regression model in addition to the, two, uh, to the independent variables. So again, these are uh, most of these, except for chi-square tests, they are parametric tests. So they have, they have assumptions to make. Uh, they have certain uh, assumptions about the data. So uh, it is very important to check the assumptions about these, those data uh, before you conduct these analysis and to understand how violation of, of uh, these assumptions can affect your outcome, your, 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 the result that you're getting, okay? So for a review of those assumptions, go back to the lecture slides. Uh, you, can, you can check the assumptions, but there are three general parametric assumptions that we've outlined earlier, that is independent uh, sampling, normality, and a homogeneity of variance. And uh, in some cases where you, you have severe violation of some of the assumptions, you can use uh, non-parametric versions of these tests. For example, a Spearman's correlation is a non-parametric version of the Pearson's correlation. Okay. Uh, I haven't talked about all the uh, non-parametric versions of the, these tests, but I, in lecture seven, I did have included a, a table that is done by uh, another statistic guy, can't remember his name. Uh, I've included that table where I have uh, listed out all the, uh, all the different alternatives to t-tests non-parametric alternatives to uh, these tests. So take a look at that decision-making, like a, it's, a, it's a flow chart, right? Take a look at that uh, if you need help on this. So we also talk about the null hypothesis significance testing paradigm. And this paradigm, again, this is widely used, but uh, highly nowadays it becomes a little bit more controversial than it was. The paradigm itself is based on what we call uh, frequency st uh, statistics. So which, which, which just means that it's a uh, con conceptualization of probability depends on frequencies. And there's some weird assumption uh, that you have noticed when, we're, when I was talking about this uh, paradigm. For example, it, uh, it assumes there's an infinite, um, number of uh, sampling that's available, right? So it assumes repeated sampling and it shows you how the prob probability works under the, uh, the assumption of repeated sampling. But that repeated sampling is usually imaginative and uh, can be actually simulated using simulations. In contrast to the frequency uh, approach to, to probability, there's a different approach called a Bayesian approach, like Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics was uh, considered wrong by Fisher, who developed this NHST paradigm. But uh, nowadays, more and more, it, 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 is, it is having a revival because people are started to realize that uh, the, the null hypothesis testing 
paradigm has its problems. So there has been a lot of progress made on Bayesian analysis, uh, uh, Bayesian statistics, and it does have a more, what I say, intuitive view about probability. And that probability uh, is just, it's just the things that happen. So the thing that happens more, how do I say, are more likely and has more values. Put it this way, right? So if you're interested in it, you can take a look at Bayesian statistics and Bayesian uh, analysis. And you'll find out that, uh, for example, Bayesian factor as a analysis uh, method can tell you, for example, based on the evidence you have, how likely or how, how unlikely is null hypothesis being true. Which we know that you, uh, the null hypothesis significance testing paradigm cannot address. So it has a more intuitive, Bayesian uh, statistics has a more intuitive way of conceptualizing prob probability and evidence. Okay. Anyway, so if you're interested in, you can take a look at Bayesian statistics. It is getting very popular. And there was a book called the Bayes uh, Rethinking Statistics. I think uh, that's, the, that's the book where I got the, uh, I got the flow chart from. But this whole paradigm, it has four steps again, right? So the first step is, uh, uh, is the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. So you basically make two opposing hypotheses and then using your statistical methods to determine which one to accept and which one to reject. And then the second step is usually you summarize the data with some kind of a test statistics, turning uh, into a sample mean, standard deviation. And then one step further, you turn those uh, statistic into a test statistics, okay? And we've learned about the Z-score, chi-square score, T and F value, these are all test statistics that uh, the probability distribution are known. Remember that uh, depends on the type of test that you, uh, relationship that you're describing, that you're working on, you're using different test statistics. But and they also have the, these kind of preconditions. But the, the key is here that uh, with these test statistics, you can obtain the p-value, right? Again, the p-value is, again, if the null hypothesis being true, how likely it is to find the results that have been found. And the smaller the p-value, the more results against the null hypothesis. And we set up this, we set up a criterion that usually p equals 0.05 as the threshold that if P is smaller than that threshold, then we choose to, to reject the, the, the null hypothesis. Okay. And for the test statistics, the most important thing is that we know the distribution of the test st statistic, and we can use the test statistic to, to determine the p-value. Okay. That's all you have to know about this whole paradigm. So all the, the different tests that you, whenever you see a p-value, you know that something like this has been carried out, regardless of what exactly is the procedure that carries out this test. And the fourth step is to either reject or we reject a null hypothesis or not, right? Again, it's a choice of whether to reject it or not. But again, it doesn't tell us whether or not to the probability of null hypothesis being true or false. So this is the whole null hypothesis significance testing procedure. Okay. And we talked about type one and type two error. And type one error is the false positive, which is usually indicated by the level of alpha. And type two error is false negative, indicated by the, the error rate beta. And you can go back to see what exactly is alpha and beta represented in the setting of uh, difference between the two sample population means. Uh, one minus beta is our statistic power. So that's all that we have learned in, uh, the, in the whole course. And uh, 
as the end process, I want to mention something really quickly that is called the uh, research practice on open science. Uh, this started by, and again, this is just related to quantitative research in general, and this is not just to, related to the research the statistics, but to our research practice. So basically, uh, in the previous few years, uh, 10 years, people started to realize a lot of the effects are difficult to replicate, are not able to replicate, including some textbook findings, right? And they're, they're also unable to reproduce some of the data, okay? So this becomes a more of an issue because uh, we're based on the theories, but if the theories are grounded on these reproducible or replicable findings, then there's a, the, the whole foundation of the field is, is in danger. So this was triggered in the social psychology when uh, there was called ESP paper, where uh, this person called Ben, he's a very controversial figure in social psychology. He published on top journal of social psychology, a paper containing nine studies showing this called PSI or ESP effect which means that people have extrasensory perception, okay? That they can predict the future. They can feel the future beyond like randomness. So this is usually in the, in the realm of, uh, of pseudoscience. But since this is published on uh, the top journal, which means that these studies have met the standards of the best journal in social psychology. They have nine studies in this paper showing evidence supporting the ESP or PSI or, or PSI, right? So this really puts, uh, so this, this uh, has gained a lot of media attention. Basically it shows that uh, you, if, you, if, you, if you have a paper that shows that ESP is real, it means that there's something, either serious, something serious going on with, this, with your science or you have, can admit that it is true, which basically violates all the physical laws that we have learned so far, right? So this really puts psychologists in the, or all scientists between a rock and a hard place. So, uh, okay, there's a lot of replication efforts reporting that uh, they have failed to replicate the findings. So this is a paper that come out right after the original paper that are showing that in seven experiments with 3,000 participants, they were unable to find any kind of effect. But th this doesn't stop. The author of the original paper did a meta-analysis of all the findings that he claimed have been published so far and claiming that there is supporting evidence for his findings, right? So this really uh, shows us gives a trigger, this is just one of the important, uh, very significant trigger of the whole replication crisis. And afterwards, they're finding that a lot of the papers, including a lot of textbook findings, cannot be replicated. And there's a lot of causes of this replication crisis. Uh, one is that in, in, in our research practice, that we have a lot of underpowered studies with small sample sizes. We have questionable research practices, okay, that I never, that I will talk about uh, soon. And there's a lack of transparency and openness, which means people refuse to share their materials and their original data. And also researchers didn't, did not pay enough attention to the measures and to the experimental procedures. Instead, they just, they just take whatever conclusions that throw at them at a very, categorical level, it's just, like, it just like a journalist reading a, a paper instead of a researcher, right? And they're also in the journals, if you look at the journals, you see that journals also have pu strong publication bias favoring the not significant results. They also like to publish novel findings and so that researchers have to constantly looking for counterintuitive findings. And finally, journals seem to favor, a lot of reviewers seem to favor so-called conceptual replications, which is so-called replications with a completely different procedure and materials over exact replication, which means replications, independent replications using exactly the same materials 
and procedure. So the overall field about this, uh, the overall, in the, in the overall field, is especially social psychology, and now this has been uh, spread out to a lot of other sciences, such field of sciences, in, in medical science, in the, uh, in the in economics and sociology, I think people are now be, becoming more aware of this replication crisis. And one of the causes is, is so-called questionable research practice. And, and this is, this is uh, again, uh, uh, so which means that during data collection that uh, the, the, the researchers engage in some practices that inflated the p-value. Basically, if you if you just saying if you use threshold as p smaller than 0.05, then you can have these kind of a flexibility when you collect data. You can choose you can include more than one dependent variables, and just choose choo pick the dependent variable, cherry pick the, the dependent variable that is significant, and not report other de dependent variables. You can also choose sample size. You can do the stop and go method, which means that you look at the data during data collection and do uh, collect data until p is smaller than 0.05. You can include covariates. That is, ad hocly, you include another variable into analysis that you haven't thought about before. You try it until the p is smaller than 0.05. Or you can, you can report a subset of experimental conditions. So if you have, I have three, three conditions, I selectively report that I have only had two conditions because those two conditions give me p is more than 0.05. And this kind of flexibility seriously inflated the rate of false positive rate, which we know is the alpha rate, okay? So if we set the alpha rate at 0.05, but if we engage in these different kind of flexibility, you can see that if we have 0.05, if you have 0.05 uh, alpha at 0.05, but if we have used method A, our actual alpha is 0.09, B is 0.77, C, you, you can see that individual methods can inflate alpha rate. But what's worst is the combination of different methods, right? If we combine A, B, and C, you can see that p is a p of 0.05 actually inflated onto p equals 30%, which is 0.3. If we include, you use all four methods, then you have an actual alpha level of 0.6. So your false positive rate is inflated from 5% to 60% if you combine all four different flexible so-called questionable data practice, uh, questionable research practice. There's also the fire drawer problem, right? The fire drawer problem means that the researchers only report the studies that produces a positive effect. Like, and then they select a report. So one study, one significant finding uh, reported, uh, four or five studies that have non-significant findings thrown into the fire drawer, right? And this used to be a uh, very difficult to, uh, to, to, to address problem because you don't know, like you basically relying on the researcher's own consciousness whether to report it or not. And you, if, the, if the researchers don't tell you about it, you can spend your years trying to replicate a study and unable to and thinking that there's something wrong with your study. So nowadays, uh, the, one of the progress we've made in open science is that now there are methods to actually detect this fire drawer problem, which is called a method called the p-curve. The p-curve basically look at the distribution of p-values. Remember, any values can, we can observe a distribution, right? So what p-curves does is that it observes the distribution of statistically significant p-values for a set of studies. And if there's a true effect, a true effects are expected to generate a certain pattern of p-curves, okay? So it's right skewed p-curves. So in this little uh, table, they showed on top is the without p-hacking, 
right? Without p-hacking. So if you have an effect size that increases, then that's the kind of p-curve that you would expect. So if you have a small effect size of Cohen's d equals 0.3, you got a p-curve that's shaped like this. So the p-distribution will be distributed across 0 0.01, 0 0.05, from 0 0.01 to 0 0.05. So actually me share of p value smaller than 0.05 is actually less than, uh, it's actually only 15%. Most p-values will actually be less than 0.01. So if you compare that to, if you have these p-hacks or p-hack results, you get a completely different shape of distribution of p-values. So if you look at different studies and compile the, their p-values together, you can know that on a specific topic, there is some kind of, whether there is systematic p-hacking or questionable research practice, they call it p-hacking or not. So this is a set of studies that they suspected they have p-hacking. So the green line is the expected p-value, right? And the, the blue line is the actual observed p-value. And you can see that most of the p-values are smaller than 0.05 or 0.04 instead of smaller than 0.01. What do you expect if there's a true defect, most of the p-values should be smaller than 0.01. So there's a completely different pattern of the distribution of p-values if it's for the studies that they have suspected that there's some kind of questionable, questionable research practice going on. And in con contrast, there's, if you, for some studies that they, there's, they, they don't suspect p-hacking, what they observed, the p-value they observed is actually consistent with the p-values that are predicted. So these new methods sort of allow us to address the fire draw problem to, and to, to detect what the researchers have actually conducted questionable research practices. So here are some suggestions that they have made for researchers that nowadays these are becoming journal standards. When you report your data, they want to know about these standards. Some journals have made this a hard requirement, but nowadays most journals will require you to report your data analysis in a more transparent way. And also they make recommendations for reviewers saying that they should be more tolerant for imperfections in results, for example. There has been a lot of efforts to address this replication crisis and to promote open science such as nowadays, they will require, require uh, a lot of the journals will encourage you to pre-register your study before you conduct a study. That pre-register your hypothesis, you cannot change it afterwards. Right? There are also more platforms of open science where people share their results and people share their, uh, statistic, uh, their, their uh, study materials. And there are also more global efforts for replication, exact replications among PhD students or to test the key hypothesis. There was just a new paper coming out where they have crowdsourced to test key hypothesis, which is quite interesting. Uh, I will show, uh, I'll share that uh, the paper in the folder. There's also has been an improvement in publication culture where journals are now more open to at first they trying to reward open and transparent research practice by giving away so-called badges and there are more uh, efforts in journals to publish uh, results that are replications or uh, non-significant non, uh, non results. And there are also journals dedicated to these replications or data. So for example, uh, there's a, the biggest platform nowadays uh, is the Open Science Framework where you can do pre-registration and you can share your results or share your preprints. Uh, share the data. Uh, there are all now journals that just publish data itself, such as Nature now have the journal called Scientific Data. So this is an open access journal for data sets. Uh, there are also, this is the, the website to the, to the, to, to, uh, for, the, uh, for the journal. Again, open science framework. And if you're interested uh, for more open data, uh, for other open data, you can always find it. There are plenty of open data resources and UK government is one of them. Uh, so this is it. So we end this. Uh, and this is it for the whole module. And uh, 
yeah, uh, we just on time, so we don't have time for anything else. Uh, just say that, uh, yeah, it's been a month, it's quite an intense month, and I hope this is, uh, this is helpful. And uh, all the materials will be still be shared in the, in the Dropbox. And I believe there will be a post course survey about this, and I hope that most of you can participate and provide feedback. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you all and uh, good luck in your future adventure and in your project, your PhD career. All right. So I'm going to stop recording and uh, recording is stopped.